So, I mean, I think one of the things that uh, has really uh, been an advance in abdominal imaging over the past couple of years is the evaluation of the small bowel. There's a couple of techniques that we are now using, uh, including MR, obviously there's no ionizing radiation. Capsule endoscopy is really gonna be a major factor, I think, in the evaluation of the small bowel in the future. And CT, in particular with CT enterography and CT enterocolysis, and I'll explain those terms as we go through this lecture. The normal small bowel, I think it's important to realize, is paper thin when the bowel is distended. And it's a bit of a challenge to optimally distend the small bowel. You can see uh, on these two coronal representations, one patient whose intestines were distended with positive contrast material, in this case barium, but it could be gastrographin and iodine-based iodine contrast. And the other person who has had his intestines distended with neutral contrast. In both cases, the bowel, I think, is uniformly well distended. There's some differences, though, between distending the small bowel with positive contrast versus neutral contrast. First of all, on this uh, coronal uh, reformatted image with positive contrast, you cannot really see the wall of the bowel. Because it's paper thin, it's just not visualized. After the patient receives neutral contrast, one of the major benefits is the fact that the wall can be very nicely visualized as long as a good bolus of contrast has been administered. In fact, if you look at the proximal jejunal loops, you'll notice, again, the wall is paper thin, about a millimeter. You can see the valvula conventis, which is really a classic signature of the proximal small bowel, the jejunum, multiple small bowel folds, similar as you would see on a small bowel series. More distally, in the ilium, that fold pattern is not there. Of course, if this fold pattern was reversed, we would think of a celiac sprue, uh, but this is the normal small bowel fold pattern that one would visualize on a good, what we would call a CT enterogram or CT enterography. We'll talk about how exactly to distend the bowel in just a moment. Now this is again just an axial image of a different patient who has an aneurysm, but again, when the bowel is well distended, as you see here, the wall is paper thin, about a millimeter, you can see multiple enhancing valvular conventes. In the normal small bowel, the wall obviously enhances. It's a vascular organ. Distally, again, in the ilium, we see the wall as being one millimeter uh, in thickness. And again, the uh, lack of folds compared to the proximal small bowel, normal small bowel. Now, if we contrast uh, some of the differences that one would see in pathologic conditions if the bowel was distended with positive versus neutral contrast, there's some things that I think are important to recognize. Both of this is the same patient. One examination performed with positive contrast, the other with neutral contrast. And while the bowel is not totally optimally distended, and sometimes it's a bit of a challenge to do that, actually in both cases, if we concentrate on this segmental abnormality, again, a patient with a segmental Crohn's disease, and compare the exam with positive versus neutral contrast, Notice that you cannot really or, or, or fully appreciate the enhancement pattern when the patient receives positive contrast. The mucosa is obscured, and we really cannot appreciate the fact that if we look over here, that there is a target or a double halo appearance to the enhancement pattern in the small bowel. And this enhancement pattern, recognizing the fact that you do have a target appearance or hyperemia in the mucosa, suggests an inflammatory condition. You know, again, if we look at this uh, exam with positive contrast, one could consider a chronic inflammatory condition, chronic Crohn's disease, or maybe even intestinal lymphoma. But the fact that we see the enhancement pattern really tells us that there's an inflammatory condition occurring in this patient. And without neutral contrast distending the bowel, that enhancement pattern is particularly difficult to see. Obviously, as uh, Dr. Birnbaum pointed out earlier, always look for the associated findings. In this patient, we can see uh, a proliferation of the fat and prominent vasa recta in the mesentery. And this is just another example, a case from just the other day, and it really points out some of the differences that one can appreciate if the bowel is distended with positive versus neutral contrast. This is a person who has an adhesive small bowel obstruction. These are just coronal reformats, but the patient was given positive contrast to drink, which, by the way, is really not necessary in, in the setting of a small bowel obstruction. The fluid in the bowel acts as its own contrast. But Again, if you look at the proximal small bowel, it is, it's filled with dense fluid from the contrast. You cannot really appreciate the wall, yet more distally, again, you can see the wall being about a millimeter. And again, the depiction of the wall and the enhancement pattern in the wall 
is a very important finding and is better appreciated when neutral contrast is used. So the question is obviously when to use positive or neutral contrast to distend the bowel. And I think <coughs> this is uh, a bit of a controversial topic and slowly I think things are changing. Uh, to a certain extent it's, it's what you're comfortable with as well. But I think that neutral contrast should be used when considering primary small bowel pathology, whatever the clinical indication may be, so that you can really optimally evaluate the small bowel. We also use it when evaluating gastric or pancreatic or biliary pathology. I still feel that positive contrast is important, especially in oncology patients who could be otherwise cachectic, patients with right lower quadrant pain. Again, as Dr. Birnbaum pointed out, sometimes the findings of the positive contrast in the cecum and the focal thickening at the base of the cecum as well as non-opacification or opacification of the appendix can be very helpful. If a patient cannot get IV contrast, it is almost useless to give neutral contrast because you really need to see the enhancement pattern for it to be useful. So if you can't get an IV in on a patient, then you're better off using positive, uh, positive contrast material, even if the clinical concern is a primary small bowel process. Now what I want to just explain to you is uh, a technique known as CT enterography. And this is different from CT enterocolysis. CT enterocolysis is when you put a nasal jejunal tube into the proximal jejunum and forcibly distend the small bowel. This is passive small bowel distension. The patient drinks the neutral contrast and we hope to get it optimally distended. We use thin section multi-detector CT, again, one millimeter thick or less. We distend the small bowel with neutral contrast and we'll talk about how we do that in just a moment. You have to use a rapid bolus of IV contrast, generally about four mLs per second. Use a 20 gauge IV, and you absolutely need a 3D workstation to evaluate these data. And here you can see very nicely the segmental involvement of a, of a, a loop of distal ileum in a patient with Crohn's disease. Now I'm gonna show you an example. This is a patient, this is what I would consider a CT enterography, a patient with Crohn's disease. The patient, if we just scroll through this data, these are coronal oblique images the patient had previously had a right colectomy for a right colon cancer. And you can see he also had Crohn's disease. This is the level of the anastomosis. This is the colon, this is the ileum. And this loop of ileum is thickened. And when Crohn's disease recurs, generally it recurs at the level of the anastomosis as we see here. As we scroll through this data set, you'll notice that these two loops are tethered together. They kind of fistulize together. I think it's pretty clear to see. We continue uh, further uh, ventrally in this patient. Again, you see another uh, fistula between those two loops of small bowel. So this is, a, again, what I would consider a typical CT enterogram. This is what you should be shooting for for optimal detection of the uh, small bowel. Now that said, I think that we have a lot of uh, potential with CT enterography, and I think it's gonna be a very good technique. But as I pointed out in the beginning that there are other uh, techniques that we can use to evaluate the small bowel and depending on what the clinical indications are, we really need to optimize our imaging paradigm. This is a patient who has obscure GI bleeding. We did a CT enterography, we could not see anything. The next week the patient had a capsule endoscopy and you'll notice that there's a small telangiectasia or angiodysplasia and in fact it's bleeding a little bit. There's a blush of, of blood that we see. This is just simply not visible on a CT enterogram. Similarly, the very early changes of Crohn's disease, these little mucosal ulcerations, are much better appreciated on capsule endoscopy than on CT enterography. But I think that the combination of CT enterography and capsule endoscopy are really gonna revolutionize our ability to evaluate the small bowel. Let's face it, how many small bowel series do you guys do in your clinical practice? How often do they actually show any pathology? I can almost just dictate the case without ever looking at it as, you know, as a normal small bowel. But I think that we do have some opportunities to really better investigate uh, the small bowel. Now, the question is, what do you use to distend the small bowel? And when you're using neutral contrast for CT enterography? Well, obviously the cheapest and perhaps easiest thing to do is to use water. The problem with water is that it gets absorbed in the small bowel and generally distally you can have very poor distension. You can mix the water with a number of different agents, uh, mannitol, bulk fibers, such as Metamucil, uh, locust bean gum, which honestly, I, it's some sort of root of a plant that's used in Europe. We don't use this here. It kind of sounds strange, uh, but has been reported on. Uh, polyethylene glycol, or go lightly, that's stuff that uh, some gastroenterologists use to clean out the colon prior to a colonoscopy has been recommended. And then 
there is a commercially available product, and I don't want this to be a commercial bias, but it's called Volumen. And in fact, I can tell you that at the um, RSNA this year, there was a whole session devoted on small bowel looking at neutral contrast agents. And this is a very popular agent when specifically looking to do CT enterography. In fact, a colleague of mine, uh, Alec Megabo, as, as well as Liz Hecht, presented a paper last year at the RSNA on this, comparing it to water, showing that it caused significantly better bowel distension. And this is actually in press now in radiology. So I think that this stuff, volumen, uh, works. There are some issues with it. Some patients have uh, diarrhea when it's used in the volumes that it's recommended. In addition, it's not cheap. It's, it's about three times as expensive as barium. And I, you know, again, I would caution you to use these agents when they're really appropriate and not to indiscriminately use them. A couple of years ago when I was at the RSNA before this Volumen product was available, uh, a friend of mine from Rome was telling me that he uses polyethylene glycol, that is, go lightly to distend the small bowel. And this is a patient who had obscure GI bleeding, not seen by the upper or lower endoscopy, and the surgeon was going to take this 80-year-old woman to surgery to do a small bowel, uh, uh, basically to run the small bowel to see if there's any pathology there. I told him, well, let's try to do this uh, CT enterography. I said, well, we can use the go lightly and give it a shot. So I told the, the recommendation is to use a single liter and scan 45 minutes later. The woman was an inpatient in the hospital. She wound up getting two liters on the floor by the nurse. She got lost in the elevator on the transport down. Two hours later, she got onto the CT table. Massive diarrhea all over the place. Suffice it to say, we've never used go lightly again. But even though it's a suboptimal study in an older patient, I think if we really look closely, we can all appreciate these multiple dense lesions, presumably enhancing lesions in the small bowel. In fact, on the coronal reformatted image, again, it's not an optimal study. The bowel distension is not great. But one, two, three, four, five hypervascular lesions on that one coronal uh, image. Now, if you ever see multiple hypervascular lesions in the small bowel, I think your number one diagnosis has to be carcinoids. They're frequently multiple. They're frequently hypervascular. This was taken uh, the patient to the operating room now, and you can see these multiple lesions. We could see some of them, but not all of them on the CT enterography. One other thing regarding the technique is what time should we use to evaluate when we're specifically looking at the small bowel. And, you know, traditionally on a 16-slice scan of uh, portal venous, our routine abdominal acquisition is at about 80 seconds after a bolus of contrast. But if you look at this patient who just so happened to get scanned at 40 seconds and 80 seconds and look at this loop of abnormal uh, distal ileum, or submucosal edema, look at the enhancement pattern at 40 seconds and at 80 seconds. It's much clearer to see that hyper-enhancement of the mucosa on the early phase image. And it's been suggested that 60 seconds might be an ideal time to do CT enterography. And in fact, that's what our protocol is. And I use 60 seconds as opposed to 40 seconds just so that I can get pretty good enhancement of the rest of the abdominal organs. And I'd rather not do a dual acquisition because of the dual radiation. So we're just trying to do one single acquisition to optimally evaluate the small bowel. So with that, as a bit of a background in terms of what's new in terms of, of how to distend the small bowel and evaluate it with CT enterography, I want you to consider this pattern approach when you do encounter an abnormal uh, segment or loop of bowel during your uh, imaging evaluation. Having a 3D workstation, being able to look at it in multiple different uh, planes can be very helpful in, in, in determining a lot of these uh, features that you really should look at for every single time you see an abnormal bowel. And those things are the enhancement pattern, the length of involvement, the degree of thickening, whether that thickening is symmetrical or asymmetrical, the location in the bowel, and always look for associated findings as well. And so when I say the location in the bowel, I don't only mean what its location in terms of terminal ileum versus jejunum, but the location, whether it's a mucosal process, a submucosal process, or a serosal process. And you might be saying, well, how can you determine those things on CT? Well, I'll tell you that you often can, and that really is also another clue to the differential diagnosis. So regarding the enhancement pattern, I think is probably the single most important thing that I look at when evaluating the small bowel. And it can be difficult, and as I mentioned in the beginning, I think it is optimally evaluated when you use neutral contrast to distend the small bowel. And there's four different patterns that I think are generally uh, seen, and one is a target or a double halo appearance. This implies a benign condition when it's in the small bowel. 
You can see a target or a double halo in the rectum or in the stomach as a result of an infiltrating scirrus type adenocarcinoma. But in the small bowel, no, it implies that it's a, a benign condition, and one of these things that I've listed here. Homogeneous attenuation after a good bolus of enhancement can be seen in neoplasm, specifically lymphoma. Intramural hemorrhage occasionally, although I must admit that most of the time with intramural hemorrhage, you'll see a target type of appearance because of the good boluses and, uh, and dynamic acquisition that we obtain. And then chronic inflammatory conditions, certainly when fibrosis develops, will show homogeneous as opposed to a target appearance. Heterogeneous uh, enhancement is seen in neoplasms, gist tumors, and adenocarcinomas. And diminished attenuation, which is probably the most difficult to e evaluate for or to determine, is seen obviously in intestinal ischemia. So let me just <coughs> show you some examples. And when you look at an abnormal bowel and look at the enhancement pattern, also try to determine the length or the degree of involvement and, and how thick it actually is. So here we have a patient that has a beautiful target appearance, right? There's enhancement of the mucosa, there's submucosal edema, and then again, enhancement of the muscularis or serosa, probably a combination of both. Neutral contrast was used in this patient. Rather marked thickening, I would say this is about a centimeter thick, these loops of bowel, there's some edema, and a very long segment. And so we have to consider what this could possibly be. And, you know, always look at the SMA and SMV. Clearly, they're open in this patient. Um, could this be infectious enteritis? It's possible, but to be perfectly honest, most cases of, of jejunitis or ileitis that are infectious do not cause this degree of thickening. It's usually more mild thickening. But it's always important to ask, could the patient be HIV positive? Another thing that you always have to think about when you see a target appearance like this is vasculitis. And even though vasculitis is a form of ischemia and end arteritis, it frequently presents differently with more marked thickening. And this is a patient with lupus of vasculitis. You can see the edema from the nephritis in both of the, of the kidneys. Another patient who has mild uh, proximal small bowel thickening, and if you look carefully, there's a target appearance that we see in this patient. Uh, loops of ileum are also involved, and in fact, the cecum also shows mild thickening and a target appearance. So we have diffuse small bowel involvement. You know, again, diffuse small bowel involvement, you could be thinking of vasculitis, but usually going to see more in the way of ascites. Could this be infectious enteritis? It's possible. But again, always look at the superior mesenteric artery and vein, and in this patient, if we look at the SMV, it is clearly uh, enhancing and patent. The SMA shows a large filling defect within Always look for associated findings. In this patient, there is a wedge-shaped defect in the left kidney. So these findings are consistent with embolic disease, which is the primary cause of, of surgical small bowel mesenteric ischemia. I mean, we also see low flow more common than this, but those patients usually don't have to go to surgery. When you see something like this, and, you, and this patient does have atrial fibrillation, this is not a patient that we really should be trying to do a thrombolysis on. I mean, this patient really belongs in the OR because you have an embolus, which has probably been sitting in that heart for some time. It's not going to be amenable to thrombolysis. But also, we have evidence on the imaging findings that there's intestinal ischemia. And this patient was taken to the operating room shortly after that CT scan was performed. And already at that point, the cecum is gangrenous. Here's the transverse colon with those epiploic appendages that uh, uh, Bernie was showing us earlier when they can infarct. But notice all of the small bowel is dusky and red. This was non-viable. This patient actually wound up dying shortly after the surgery from basically the comp complications of intestinal ischemia. So even though the patient was taken to the operating room right away, it was already too late in this patient. By the way, look at the size of this surgeon's hand. You don't want this guy doing any delicate work uh, on you. <coughs> now the target sign, by the way, was first described by Frager uh, in JCAP back in 1983, and believe it or not, this was said to be a specific sign for Crohn's disease. In other words, if you see a target sign, it means Crohn's disease, and clearly that's not the case. Any kind of edema, inflammation, ischemia, uh, even intramural hemorrhage can cause this, so just be careful. But Crohn's disease, you know, as was pointed out, will frequently cause segmental involvement. You can see skip areas, proliferation of fat, and the prominent vasorecta. Now, if we look at this other patient who also has Crohn's disease, and we do see a target appearance. There's a difference in this target versus this target, right? Here we have edema in the submucosa, and here we have very low attenuation. This is submucosal fat deposition. And this has always been thought to be a sequela of chronic inflammation of Crohn's disease. And in fact, it probably is the case in this patient. This patient was asymptomatic. But uh, it's been my experience that if you see submucosal fat, whether it's in the colon or the, or the ileum, 
or in the stomach for that matter, it's usually a normal variant. And there was a paper published in AJR back in 2003 which confirmed that finding that the vast majority of times that you see submucosal fat deposition in the small bowel, the patient has no history of chronic inflammatory disease. Now, this is homogeneous attenuation. After a bolus of contrast, you can see the arteries are well enhanced. Mark thickening, segmental in distribution. Really, this could only be one thing, and this is ileal lymphoma, homogeneous attenuation. Occasionally, intramural hemorrhage can cause this degree of thickening, but usually going to see a lot more hemorrhage in the adjacent uh, peritoneal cavity as a result of it leaking across the serosa. Now, here's a, a person who has a target appearance. And if we look at this segmentally involved uh, loop, this is a submucosal process. And I want you to just take a look at this for a second, because this is showing that the thickening is due to some sort of substance in the submucosa. You know, if you, you could imagine if you did a small bowel series in this patient, that you would see that stack of coins appearance. Whenever you see this in an older patient, I mean, one thing that you always have to think about is, could this be intramural hemorrhage? Is the patient on Coumadin? Is the INR elevated? And in fact, this patient is on Coumadin. The INR is 5. And these findings, the patient presents with acute abdominal pain is related to intramural hemorrhage. If you do a small bowel series on somebody like this, you will see similar findings. That is segmental distribution. You can see the submucosal process. The mucosa is entirely normal. It is not disrupted. This is a fluid, or in this case, hemorrhage, filling that submucosal space. Heterogeneous enhancement, as we see here, is due to neoplasms. I thought this was going to be a gastrointestinal stromal tumor that ulcerated. In fact, this was resected and turns out to be an adenocarcinoma. A little bit unusual to have such a large adenocarcinoma, but you see something like this. I don't think there's any question that it's most likely going to be a neoplasm and usually a gist or possibly an adenocarcinoma. Now, the fourth and final enhancement pattern we see here, this is uh, you know, imaging findings that I think a colleague of mine, Dr. Balthazar, pointed out many years ago are classic for a closed loop small bowel obstruction. That is, you see a radial array of multiple loops of small bowel, the mesenteric vessels all converging to a point. When you look on the scan, you'll notice that this is the afferent and the efferent limbs subtending that closed loop. What's important to realize when you look at this is that these two loops that are not in the closed loop are enhancing normally. The loops that are in the closed loop show diminished or decreased enhancement. This is a specific sign for intestinal ischemia. This patient absolutely needs to be in the operating room. Obviously, the finding of blood and edema in the mesentery is another important finding for intestinal ischemia. And this patient was taken to the operating room, and you can see all this dead gut. There's the adhesive band, and you can see the afferent and the efferent limbs that were going into that particular closed loop. All this had to be resected. It was dead. The length of involvement is also very important. And you know, this is all also in the syllabus that you have or on the CD. But focal, segmental, and diffuse diseases, as you can see here, generally are different processes. If you have diffuse disease, it's a benign process. Segmental disease is usually also benign, although occasionally lymphoma can be a benign process. If you have focal disease, consider some, some of these things that I've listed, tuberculosis, endometriosis, rare entities, but occasionally you will want to put them in your differential diagnosis. Let me just show you some examples. Here's a patient uh, who has an abnormal segment of jejunum, focal involvement. When I say focal, I mean three to five uh, centimeters. You'll notice that there is an area of thickening, and then there is this kind of collection with some fecal-like material, a lot of stranding of the fat around this area. So there's a differential diagnosis of something like this. I think that there's a bowel perforation here. The question is, is it a foreign body perforation? Could it be a, a jejunal neoplasm that perforated? But don't forget that diverticula don't only occur in the colon, don't only occur in the sigmoid and the ascending colon, but do occur in the small bowel. These imaging features to me are most consistent with jejunal diverticulitis. The patient was taken to the operating room. That segment of jejunum was resected. Here you can see on the serosal level, the perforated diverticulum, and on the luminal side, the entrance into that diverticulum. Whether it's in the jejunum, the ileum, or the duodenum, diverticula can occur, and just keep that in your differential diagnosis. This we see not infrequently, uh, perforations due to fish bones, these very linear dense things, in this case going through the duodenum and into the pancreas, you know, really stabbed right through that. These are very classic for fish bone perforation. Uh, they did an endoscopy in this patient to try to extract it, but they couldn't see it because it had burrowed into the musculature of the duodenum. Finally, they had to take the patient to the operating room and pull this out. And I am told that this turned out to be a gefilte fish bone. Don't ask me how, but just be careful. Uh, whatever you're eating. 
Another patient uh, who has, again, multiple loops of small bowel or distended. This is on a four-slice scanner. Nothing uh, special about this. Wall is nice and normal. But notice over here, the wall is, is normal. We come down, there is a focal area of abnormal thickening, irregularity, homogeneous attenuation. What is this? Could it be an adenocarcinoma? Could it be a lymphoma or a chronic inflammatory condition? I'm not entirely sure, but I was leaning towards carcinoma. Uh, the guy had an obstruction, as you can see, and he was taken to the operating room, and it was resected. And you can see this is this. And, you know, I was looking at this. I could probably tell you this is an adenocarcinoma, and you'd believe me, but in fact, this turns out to be a focal amyloidoma in the small bowel. So, you know, we have all these rules. We try to narrow the differential diagnosis down, but there's always something out there that's going to, you know, cause us some trouble. But just keep in mind that there's a lot of things that can affect the small bowel. Another patient on the CT enterography, this guy has abdominal pain. You can see on the axial image that there's actually a perforation in the small bowel. The coronal image, I think, very nicely displays the segmental nature of this abnormality. It's homogeneous in enhancement, although somewhat hyper-enhancing. Here's the perforation, multiple lymph nodes. We looked at this. We weren't sure, could this be Crohn's disease or could it be a neoplasm? And if it's a neoplasm, we want to consider lymphoma given the segmental distribution. Well, again, if you look for incidental findings, we really do not see the proliferation of the fat, the prominent vasorectal here. Yes, there are some lymph nodes that can be seen in Crohn's disease. In any event, this patient was taken to the operating room. And in fact, this turns out to be segmental lymphoma in the small bowel with a focal perforation, which we've seen a number of times. So keep that in mind in your differential diagnosis. Here's a person, 84-year-old guy, had crampy abdominal pain. He has segmental involvement of a loop of proximal jejunum. Shows thickening, a bit of en uh, enhancement of the wall. And obviously, if you look, the left kidney is absent. The guy's about 84 or some, some years old. He came in to discuss his case with me. And he told me that 30 years ago when he had his left nephrectomy, they used external beam cobalt radiation uh, as a, a adjuvant therapy. And what we're looking at here is the effects of radiation enteritis, which sometimes can manifest 10, 15, 20, even 30 years after the insult. And this guy's been presenting now with acute or crampy abdominal pain over the last few months. And I think that we're dealing with radiation enteritis. Another patient who now presents uh, with pancreatitis, we do a CT scan, it shows really the pancreas looked okay. There's a little bit of fluid in the anterior pararenal space, so very mild pancreatitis. But if we look down in the uh, distal small bowel, here's the terminal ileum, and if we just scroll through this, actually a very long segment of mildly thickened uh, small bowel extending all the way maybe 30, 40 centimeters. And again, if we look at this one image, this shows us that the abnormality is in the submucosa. Submucosal edema, you can see the contrast again. This is very typical of the appearance that we would see in a patient who has edema from whatever cause. Interestingly, this patient was recently put on an ACE inhibitor, which is known to cause pancreatitis as a medication that can cause pancreatitis, and is an agent that can cause angioedema. And angioedema is a non-inflammatory condition where you really get capillary permeability. You can see it in the bowel. It can present as an acute abdomen. And uh, there's obviously some clinical serum tests that one can do to help confirm that diagnosis. But uh, we put this case together, and the patient's uh, small intestine got better over a period of a few days. But angioedema is certain, something certainly to keep in mind and can often be due to medications. So when you see a long segment of bowel edema and you have no other etiology and there's no vasculitis, think of this entity of angioedema. The degree of thickening is also important. In general, if you have very marked thickening, you're dealing with neoplasms, hemorrhage, or vasculitis. Again, it's very unusual for ischemia or infection to cause marked thickening, although in the colon, obviously, infection can cause severe uh, marked thickening, but not so really in the small bowel. And here's a, a typical patient of a, somebody who has Yersinia campylobacter uh, distal ileitis, very mild thickening despite good distension. As was pointed out uh, uh, earlier, a cluster of lymph nodes in the right lower quadrant. These are reactive lymph nodes from the mesenteric adenitis via uh, from the infectious enteritis. We put all these things together. Again, another patient who has, this is marked thickening, beautiful target appearances, right, ascites. Long segments of bowel are involved. Your most likely diagnosis, I think, when you look at something like this, is probably going to be some sort of vasculitis. And if you look at the scout film on this patient, use all the information that's available to you. It's a 34-year-old woman. The left hip has already been replaced from AVN, from the lupus and the steroid that she's been taken. Segmental involvement, marked thickening, homogeneous attenuation. The mesentery around it is entirely normal. It could only be one thing, right? This is lymphoma. 
end, end of the, the case. Another person who sustained trauma, all right, this looks very much like that lymphoma, very marked thickening, but notice all the, you know, the edema and hemorrhage in the adjacent mesentery. Uh, and of course, if you put a region of interest cursor on it, 56 Hounsfield units. Intramural hematoma can present very similar to uh, lymphoma. Symmetrical or asymmetrical thickening, this is, you, you think about that, but asymmetrical thickening you generally see in neoplasms, occasionally in patients with Crohn's disease. Symmetrical thickening is a benign process. Finally, the location in the wall, you know, I, I showed you some examples, mucosal, submucosal, and serosal disease. This is what we need to look for. A patient who clearly has, I think, no question, submucosal process. I hope that you can all see this. This edema in the submucosa, the mucosa is entirely normal. Here is the small bowel series, again, showing that thumbprinting appearance of a patient with intramural hemorrhage. And if you look at a pathologic specimen, this is not the same patient, but again, showing the hemorrhage in here, showing as it goes through the folds and its location uh, absolutely in the submucosa. Another patient who has bowel wall thickening in the terminal ileum, but this is not submucosal disease. I mean, there is a submucosal component, but the mucosa is entirely ulcerated. All right, so we're thinking terminal ileum. These findings are consistent with Crohn's disease, as you can see on the small bowel series, as well as on the coronal reformatted image showing the ulcerations. And finally, a patient who I think unequivocally on both the coronal MR and the coronal CT shows serosal disease, spiculation and tethering into this mesenteric mass on the CT, which shows calcifications on the MR, which is just low signal intensity, a patient with a mesenteric carcinoid causing that desmoplastic Reaction And on the small bowel series in this patient, you see the same findings. The mass is in the mesentery causing that tethering and speculation. Always look, as I pointed out throughout this entire lecture, for the associated findings. So in conclusion, I want to make you think, if you have a case of a person who has a primary small bowel process, to use those techniques to optimize your small bowel distension, so-called CT enterography. I think in the vast majority of cases, you do not need to do CT enterocolitis. While a pattern approach is helpful, obviously findings can overlap and there's always a differential diagnosis. So look for those associated findings in the clinical history and you can really often narrow your differential diagnosis way down. Thanks a lot.